Let's make a start, shall we? Well, good morning, everyone. Morning, welcome to Rock Baptist Church. Okay, Google, stop. My name stop. is Heather Duke and I'm a member of the church family here. Particular welcome if you are new or visiting us today. And welcome to those of you on Zoom as well. I'd like to share some words I read recently. See if you can spot yourself on this list. To all who are weary and need rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To all who fail and desire strength. To all who sin and need a saviour. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Welcome. Let's stand and sing our first song together. Praise and glorify our God. Stand to sing. say welcome again to those of you that have joined us in the first song it's good to see you so this morning we begin our sermon series in the continue our sermon series in the book of 1 Samuel and Matt Peckham our assistant minister will bring God's word to us a bit later it is an action-packed passage um, and demonstrates God's holiness and his power and his might and let us bow our knees this morning that the same God that we read about in 1 Samuel offers an invitation for us to come to him through Jesus Christ, 
The mighty Father who put the stars in the sky says, come to me. And there is a verse in Isaiah that puts it far more beautifully than I could. And Mia Abraham is going to come and read that verse now. Isaiah, verse, no, Isaiah 57 verse 15. God lives forever and is whole. He is high and lifted up. And he says, I live in a high and holy place. But I also live with people who are sad and humble. I give new life to those who are humble. I give new life to those whose hearts are broken. Thank you, Mia. Let's respond to God's word in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are a holy and powerful God, deserving of our praise and our reverence. And yet we confess that we fall so far short. We know our own thoughts. We know our own selfishness and our natural tendency to go our own way. And yet we can have confidence this morning that all that needs to be done has been done by Jesus Christ in our place. And so we come to you this morning in his name. You have filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. May we hunger for you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to sing of God's greatness together now with our next two songs. Let's stand to sing.
invite Ross now to come and speak to us. A lot of our songs this morning talk about where God is. We've sung that God is in a high and holy place. Later on we'll sing God is in the highest place. So it's good to think about where is God? Let me start like this. God is three persons. So let me ask you, where is Jesus? I think, where is Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. That's good. Next test. Um, where was Jesus 2,000 years ago? He was here with us on earth. Very good. Hands up. If you think, could it be possible that you go home for lunch today and Jesus is waiting outside to have lunch with you. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Jesus coming to your house for lunch? Yeah. Jesus is like that. We can imagine Jesus being with us. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the Holy Spirit? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Miriam. Do it try? Where's the Holy Spirit? <coughs> With God. That's a good answer. Yeah. Where else is the Holy Spirit? I think between Reuben and Jacob, we're doing really well this morning. Lydia, where is the Holy Spirit? He's in our hearts. Isn't that amazing? We can imagine Jesus coming to have lunch with us today. And we, can, we know that the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. Where is God the Father? Jojo. In heaven. Where is this place? We're trying to think this morning about how, what does it mean for God to be in this high and holy place? And it's not an... Tell me... Whoa! <laughs> Where is this high and Way outside the holy system, solar system. Way outside the universe. That's a good answer. Um, but there's more. Thank you, Isaac. That was a really good answer. I like your answer. And there's more to it we need to think about this morning as to where God is. So I'm going to give you a strange test. A test that would never happen in real life, I think but you have to use your imagination. So imagine that you're walking along the street 
Maybe you're walking home from school and you come across God's phone lying on the ground. Here it is. Here, here's God's mobile. It's unlocked. Um, what would you do? Here's God's phone. Anybody want to, you want to take a look? Yeah? Well, what do you want to do? You, you found God's phone on the pavement. What would you do? Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. Or imagine that you're walking along and you find God's wallet lying on the ground. Lydia, you seem interested in God's wallet. Really? Well, have a look. there you go. There's, there's God's wallet. You want to take a look inside? Interesting. Imagine if you're walking along and you came across this. What on earth is this? This is God's suitcase of power. And look, the latches are open. Does anybody want to look inside? Yeah? God's suitcase of power? Yeah? Yeah? Um, what do you want to do with that? <laughs> Should we put it back, maybe? Just thank you. Good. That was just something for your imagination. But in the Old Testament, something a bit like this actually happened. Let's look at the Ark of the Covenant. Here is something that was a little bit like God's phone. When Aaron and the other priests wanted to talk to God, they would come before this box. And this is a bit like God's phone. It's a little bit like God's wallet. This was a place where some of the really special things to God were kept inside. It was also a bit like God's suitcase of power. They knew that God was powerful. But when they went out to fight a war, they would bring this with them. They thought of God as being kind of seated on this. Now, when you go to your classes, the grown-ups will hear what happened next, that God's people took this into a war and they lost. And the Philistines took the ark back with them and they put it in their temple. And in their temple, they had a different god called Dagon. And they said, well, the way we think about this is we've got God's phone, his wallet, his suitcase of power now. We've got this. This is ours. This is something we can use. We'll put it before our God because we're in charge of this now. We've got this special thing. We're in charge of it. Does anybody know what happened next? I'm going to ask, yeah. Ah, after a while, actually, something happened first. Isaac, can you come and help me? I can't look. If, I, if I'm in profile, does that look like me? Exactly. It's my shadow. But now I'm going to ask you to do something for me, something fun. Yeah? I'm wondering, Isaac, would you like to push over this statue. Oh. Somebody else might like. Mia, just come and give it a push from behind. <laughs> that was good. Thank you, Mia. So the Philistines got a surprise. They woke up in the morning and there was their God smack lying on his face. I think that was a warning. And a lot of other things happened with the Philistines, and you can ask your mum and dad about that when you're home for lunch today. But eventually they said, we can't cope with this box. Um, we're going to give it back. And 
And so they put it on a cart, and the cart was carried by some cows, and off the box went back to God's people. So finally, God's phone, his wallet, his powerful thing, comes back to God's people. Imagine you're at home, and you look out the window, and you see this coming on a cart, pulled by two cows, and you think, amazing. It's just like finding the things on the street. And like you, people wanted to look inside, take a look. What do you think happened when they looked inside? They died. It's hard for us to imagine how high God is above us. It's hard for us to imagine just how good God is, so good that if you were just to open this box, you would die. It's very hard to imagine just how high God is. Now, you won't find God's phone lying around. You won't find his wallet. You won't find his suitcase of power. You won't find these things just lying around like this. But we still have to think, how do we respect God in the same way? That's something you can talk about over lunch. And something to think about while we stand together and sing our next song. God is in the highest place. for the young people to go to their classes but there are just a couple of notices um, so this evening um, we've got an evening service at 7 p.m here here at Morley and Mike will be preaching from 1 John 2 um, church weekend away um, there's a deadline coming up I feel like a bit of a hypocrite telling other people about a deadline um, 10th of June to book your place and pay a deposit um, so do come along to that and do be in touch with Cheryl if you need any other information um, and then we had on at our prayer meeting this week we heard from the European Mission Fellowship which part of our Easter offering went to it was so humbling to hear about their work across Europe and there's some literature some leaflets and things that will be available 
at the end near the tea and coffee. So please do take some information about that if you would like to. Great. Well, let's have a short break while the young people leave us and then we'll come back together.
Shall we come back together now? Well, at Rock at the moment, we have got um, young people sitting exams, GCSEs and A-levels. And we've also got um, young people that came to Rock who are now at university and coming home for the long summer break. So Dan Hark is very kindly going to come and pray for those young people now. Um, yeah, so uh, Katie and I uh, help out with Blueprint, which is the uh, 14 to 18 uh, youth group. And um, a, a frequent prayer request over the last um, couple of months or so has been the exams. Um, and um, yeah, with them being cancelled over the last two years, I think it's, it's been particularly on um, young people's minds. So let's, let's pray for them. <clears throat> God, you have given us uh, each different gifts and talents. And uh, God, you, you want us to work hard and to develop them and to um, uh, expand them, Lord. And exams are a great opportunity for young people to show what they've learned. Um, and God, I pray that you will uh, be with them as they prepare for exams and uh, uh, revise and study, Lord, and that they can get uh, the grades that they deserve. God, we also want to pray for the young people um, who are feeling stressed um, and busy with the exams, and particularly with them being cancelled uh, with the pa pandemic over the last two years. Um, we know that teaching has been disrupted with lessons being moved online, and uh, this has um, added extra stress and pressure for a really uh, stressful time. We pray that the young people won't be overwhelmed by this and that they also take time out for rest and relaxation. Uh, we thank you that uh, schools and teaching and exams have been able to return to some normality and that there is more certainty and the young people know what to expect. God also want to pray for young people who are not academically gifted for whom the exams can be particularly difficult and frustrating and also a disappointing time. We pray also for parents with young people, uh, give them wisdom on how best to support their young people taking the exams, know when to encourage them to revise and when to rest. Um, and God, um, in amongst all the exams and everything, uh, we, we do pray that that goes well for the young people, but we also know, Lord, that you use people from all walks of life um, to carry out your purposes, and we know that um, we don't need uh, good exam results to serve you. Amen. Thanks, Dan. It's time for our Bible reading now. Strap yourselves in. It's a long but action-packed passage, and we've got two readers coming to read to us, so Nicola Hemmings and Matt Day as well. So we'll start at 1 Samuel 4, verse 1. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. <clears throat> so the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, 
all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We are doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the Ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old, and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I've just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. <coughs> Eli asked, What happened, my son? The one who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel for forty years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labour and gave birth, but was overcome by her labour pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the Ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumours. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. But after they'd moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, 
throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumours. So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. As the Ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the Ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the Ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumours, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. When the Ark of the Lord had been in the Philistine territory for seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and diviners and said, What shall we do with the Ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, if you return the ark of God of Is if you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed, and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, What guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, Five gold tumours and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumours and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did when Israel's God dealt harshly with them? Did they not send all the Israelites out so that they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take the calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and in a chest beside it, put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory towards Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we shall know that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened to us by chance. So they did this. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and penned, them, uh, penned up their calves. They placed the Ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumours. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left, the rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord, together with the chest containing the gold objects, and placed them on, a large, on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned that same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumours the Philistines sent as a guilt offering to the Lord, one each for Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers, the fortified towns with their country villages. The large rock on which the Levites set the Ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God, to whom will the ark go up from here? Then they sent messengers to the people of kirath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. So the men of kirath Jerem came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, the son of his son, to God the ark of the Lord. The ark remained at kirath Jerem a long time, 
20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. Good morning, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much for reading all that. It's a mammoth passage, isn't it? Um, Let's pray and ask for God's help and then we'll we'll dive in together. Father God, thank you that you have acted in history. Thank you that you have preserved your actions in writing that has been passed to us. Um, We pray that we would learn from it this morning. Please would we listen to you and that we would be challenged and encouraged In Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever noticed that you can't seem to get rid of God? Have you ever noticed that? You just can't seem to get rid of him. Whatever sort of time in history or whatever way that our culture is going, he sort of is there or he comes back. These are two um, covers of Time magazine from the 60s. So the one on the left there is from 66, I think. Uh, I think the other one's from 69. And so, so there is the one in 66, Is God Dead? And you can imagine, can't you, kind of post two world wars and uh, kind of free love of the 60s and we don't need God. And as Nietzsche said, God will be dead in the 20th century. And there's the question. But three years later... Here's that, is God coming back to life? People are coming um, back to, to faith, and you saw even bits of that through the 70s, I guess, and it just happens time and time again. That's what happens, isn't it? And let's go to more, something more recently. So here's The Guardian, uh, an article from 2018. Faith is on the rise, and 84% of the global population identifies with a religious group. What does it mean for the future? So perhaps The Guardian's sounding a bit worried there. Um, uh, one writer has called this phenomena um, the haunted secular, that we live in a secular world, but without God, we just can't get on. We don't have that meaning, uh, and we feel, a, as you might call it, a God-shaped hole. There's a sort of haunted secular. It's the ghost of God, and we need him, and he still comes back in whatever forms. There's a search for God. But the question is, how will God fit? What sort of God is it? that we're looking for. And when God comes back, when people are looking for God, he's very easily domesticated by people. Have you found that? So life's getting on very well, thank you very much, and God is a sort of cherry-on-the-cake God. I've got my life sorted out, I've found my life partner, I've got my family, I've got my house, I've got my kids in the school, Uh, you know, I'm paying off the mortgage, I think it's going very well. And the last little bit, spirituality, well, I need to plug that in somewhere. And we can domesticate God, and God's a sort of smaller version of what he is, and we've made a decision about who we think he is, and, and we sort of put him on the back burner. And then crisis comes in and when life doesn't work. So life doesn't work and perhaps that's when we call on God or perhaps we don't use him at all for those crises. And what about us? This is not just a secular out there thing. For the church, for us, we can be a bit like that. We can domesticate God, can't we? I look at my own life and think, am I just cruising through, managing to get through most obstacles without him? trying to raise my children to know God, trying to defeat sin in my life, resisting the devil, finding myself trying to be at peace with God. Oh, but then it's not going well. I've sort of been trying to do it without God, just in my own steam and my own knowledge. And I'm surprised when things don't go well. And so I think, oh, perhaps God is against me. Is God against me? And what can I do then? Well, I can either, I can either go back and pull out uh, God and say, God, please bless this thing that's going wrong. Or actually, I could dig in harder and go my own way and say, well, actually, perhaps God is against me. And I, I'm going to grit my teeth and carry on. If we have a domesticated God, if we don't have the right idea of who God is, then we're going to get things very wrong. Because if God is there 
And if he is revealed in these scriptures, then this is reality. So if we don't have this God who he says he is and he is there, then we're simply not living in reality. So not only have we, have we got God uh, wrong, as it were, but we'll have a wrong perspective on the whole of our life. And we won't see, for instance, why we need Jesus. Why would God's people need a Messiah? And part of getting a grip on that reality is knowing who the Lord God, our God, is. And this is something that the Israelites, God's people in the Old Testament, are getting to grips with here. So they've been rescued from Egypt and God said, look, I'm going to make you a people and then I'm going to be your God and I'm going to put you in a promised land. And there, very briefly, is a picture of what God is doing in all of eternity. He's rescuing a people. He's going to bring us through to his new creation. And so here are God's people, um, but it's going wrong for them because they have got God quite wrong at the moment. And there's two stories of the Ark. We've, we've thought about the Ark of the Covenant earlier. And there are two stories that we read. And they're really very well summed up in two verses. So have a look at verse 4.22. Here is Eli's daughter-in-law. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark has been captured. And then turn over to 6.20. The people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? So here's these two stories of the ark, one in Israel, uh, and then it goes to the Philistines. And they're sort of summed up for us. What's the point the writer's trying to make? Well, the glory of God has departed. And secondly, who can stand before a holy God? And we saw, didn't we, as we had these read out, that God defeats his people and the Philistines. So you could read through the Bible here and be forgiven for thinking, well, who is God for? He's defeated his people, he's defeated his, um, the, his enemies. Well, God is for himself. He has to be, doesn't he? Because he is the most worthy. He is holy. He is set apart for his glory. Holy is not just set apart in, in the abstract, He's set apart for something. It has to be for himself because he's God. And so God's people need to grasp this. A couple of weeks ago when we started the book of 1 Samuel, we saw in Hannah's prayer that her prayer is brilliant because it has the theology and the themes which drive the whole book. Do you remember what Hannah said in her prayer in chapter 2, verse 2? There is none holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. And here are God's people beginning to learn that lesson. Because the lesson they're learning here is they can't have God's glory without God's holiness. They can't have the wonderful, amazing, glorious God without his holiness. And that's what the original readers, perhaps even post-exile, uh, were reading, looking back and thinking, um, how are we to, to, to live now? And how, how did God treat us in the past? And readers would have noticed this. Did you notice this? That in all of these chapters that we had read, God doesn't speak, does he? So many words, not one word from God. And not only that, nobody speaks to God. Did you notice that? It's just the story. We don't hear from God and no one speaks to God. And that's significant Samuel is off the scene as well. We're in a book called Samuel. We were introduced to him uh, and then he's disappeared. So there's no speaking to God, no words from God, and there's no Samuel, no leader. And that's deliberate because what's happened is that the relationship between God and his people has been shattered. We'll see next week and at the end um, uh, uh, of the passage here in the beginning of next week that Israel needed to return to God. So what's going on? Well, here they are in the land and they don't have peace in the land because they are being attacked by God's enemies. And here are the Philistines. And what do they do? Well, firstly, we see that using the holy God loses his glory. They've tried to use the holy God and that will lose his glory. So the Philistines went out, uh, the Israelites went out against the Philistines and the Israelites camped at Ebenezer. 
Now, Ebenezer is a funny word. It means, it means the stone of my help. Sort of God is here, God is my help kind of thing. Well, that's ironic, isn't it? Because he's not there for them. And so they go out, the Israelite, the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. And they do get one thing right, the Israelites, don't they? Because they say, God, why did God, verse 3, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? They recognise that God has his hand against them. And that's a good question, isn't it? Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today? They don't really sit to, to discuss an answer, do they? Do we need to return to the Lord? Um, how's our leadership going? No, what they turn to is the domesticated, lucky charm, God in a box. They say, right, well, you know what we've done wrong? We've forgotten the ark. Who's in charge of the ark? Well, Eli and his sons, and you didn't bring it to the battlefield. Well, that's why we lost, isn't it? Clearly. So they take matters into their own hands, and they think, right, we're going to wheel out the ark. Where is it? Somewhere at the back of the temple. Bring it out, and, and then we'll win. It's a sort of lucky charm, God. I was reminded of these photos that I've seen recently. Have you seen photos like this? These are Russian Orthodox priests blessing Russian warheads and planes. Isn't that shocking? Oh, well, perhaps things aren't going quite so well in our war on Ukraine. Well, never mind. Let's wheel out the priests. They'll bless the warheads and bless the planes. And off we go because we'll have God on our side. It's a sort of lucky charm, superstitious religion. And that's what God's people have done. They've brought God down to our level. It's what we do when we say, well, I like to think of God as. You ever heard people start sentences like, I like to think of Jesus as. And we bring him down to our level. Ironic, isn't it, in a society where a very vocal minority want everyone to self-identify, but not God. No, God can't self-identify. We tell God who he is. I like to think he's like this and he wouldn't do that or as a, a school gate a friend mentioned to lauren just the other week we're talking about church well we don't really get along to church very often when we don't we always make sure we go to mass on a friday night that's sort of ticking the boxes covering it off they presumed on god and we can presume on god too this is not again it's not an out there problem we can presume on God. Well, I know God, I, I know who he is, and I know my Bible, uh, and he'll have to bless me when I ask for something. Or perhaps I'm somehow better because I, I've worked out these answers, and I know who Jesus is, and I know my Bible. Perhaps it's that. But I suspect, for, for a lot of us, it's a bit more subtle. If I turn inward and look at my own life, I can see it in my prayer life. Well, how can I work out how I treat God? Often in the evenings we uh, talk to the children, we say, do you have a thank you, sorry, or please prayer that you'd like to say from something that's happened today? And uh, perhaps most often with them, and I think, oh, actually most often with me, it's a please prayer. So if I did my little pie chart of thank you, sorry, and please prayers, or sort of worship, the, the please would be huge on there. Now, nothing wrong with that. We need to do all of those things. But without a holy God, well, I, I, I'm less inclined to, to thank him for who he is, to praise him. Without a holy God, I'm less inclined to be convicted of my sin and think, ah, oh, yeah, I have rejected you. I do live my own way. And so there, creeping into my prayer life is actually an indicator, mm, yes, God's really the kind of God in a box and here's a list of stuff that I need blessing. But here is the shock in this passage. The ark is captured and they are defeated again, aren't they? The Philistines are at first worried, but the Philistines fought, verse 10. The Israelites were defeated. Every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Because God will not be treated like this. That's not who God is. He's not a lucky charm. The shock here is that, that here God would rather be seen to be defeated than used by his people. I think that's really shocking. 
And so here's the, that sort of climax of the story that the, the man comes from, from, the, from the battleground. He tells Eli, uh, who, who's, who's the priest, and he falls and he dies. And, and the headline, as we've seen from verse 21, is that the glory of God has departed. That's what God would said would happen when the ark leaves. And that is a disaster because God's people needed the holy God. We need the holy God. Back in Deuteronomy, God said to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners for yourselves, as you were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise, he is your God. But now, God leaves. His glory has left. And so God would rather be seen to be defeated than be used by his people. But actually, this is still good for God's people. He is bringing about what he's promised. Do you remember before in Samuel, he's promised to bring that judgment and punishment on Eli and his sons for misleading God's people. And so there is something good that's going on. As God says, look, out with the old and in with the new. And we see Eli there in verse 18 of chapter 4. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and he was heavy. Now, interestingly, there are, there are some little details in there which we might, not, um, we might not spot in the fact that the chair, that word there, is also kind of similar or, or used for the word throne in the original. And heavy is also the same root from glory. So glory is this idea of God's weighty holiness. And so the writer here is kind of cluing us in a little bit. Eli kind of falls off his throne because he was glorious or made himself glorious and heavy. And God is saying, look, he will rid his people of glory-seeking enthroned leaders. And in the long run, as horrific as it sounds, it is good for God's people. So using the holy God loses his glory. But secondly, demeaning the holy God leaves no one standing. God will not be mocked. And so we, we heard, didn't we, that the ark was captured and the Philistines take it. And, and as uh, Ross spoke to us in the, in the children's slot, we saw that they thought, yes, We've got their God, we've got their lucky charm and we'll just, we'll, we'll park him in next to ours and he can be sort of subservient to Dagon. But God will not be mocked. I wonder if any of you remember, uh, I can't remember when it came out now, but do you remember Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Do you remember that? There we go. There's a picture of Indiana, of the, of the Lost Ark. So the story of people trying to desperately find the Ark of the Covenant because they believed it had the power of God inside it. And so if you captured the ark, you would have an invincible army. But of course, if you've seen the film, you know how it goes, that they're the, the Nazis there, they've stolen the ark of God, and, the, and they take the lid off, and the power of God is unleashed, not for them, but against them. Of course, that's just a film, but... It's based on this idea, on this truth from the Bible, that God will not be mocked. And so this is what the Philistines find out. They bring in the ark, they put it into their temple, and Dagon, in the night, falls over. It's supposed to be laughable. The writer's supposed to make us chuckle at this point. As they come in, they find uh, him down, and they, and they put him back, don't they? They rose early the next day, uh, chapter 5, verse 3. And there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and they put him back in his place. They were supposed to, what did they do? 
well, let's get the, let's get the Bostick super glue out, and they're reading the instructions, suitable for various plastics, metals, ceramics, household gods, good. And they put him back together, and they stick him on, and they, and they kind of, perhaps a bit of tape over there as well, so it can, it can be secure. And then the next morning, Dagon was fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. To think that we could slot God in with all the other gods, just file him next to everything else, and that would be okay. Of course not. And that's what the Philistines find out. But what do they do? Well, they don't worship God, do they? Did you notice that? They don't think, crumbs, this must be the real God. They don't fear him as their idols are destroyed. No, they sort of shift him on. They say, this is... um, you know, this is not good. We'll, we'll move him on to Gath. And what happens in chapter 6? At the end of chapter 5, there's an outbreak of tumours, a plague. It's a bit like the Exodus. The Philistines have recognised that. This is the God which sent the plagues on Egypt. And so they, they send the ark away, and lo and behold, God shows his power and his rule there. And it's the same message as the Exodus, that only Yahweh is God. And it's the same message as Hannah's prayer, isn't it? There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. So at this point, they, they don't know what to do. So they call in the, the, the priests. They're kind of re- religious guys. What, what do you do with another God? What sort of thing should we do? And, and, and they kind of think, well, we could, we could probably... Uh, let, let's make these gold um, tumours and some rats... And they sort of pack God off, really, with the fingers crossed as a sort of out-of-court settlement. Let's see if we can appease him uh, and maybe give him sort of glory on this occasion and get him out of our hair because we don't want this holy God. But they still doubt a bit. They think, well, it could have been God. It could have just been a coincidence. And so they say, right, well, let's put it on the cart. Uh, and if, it, if they, the cows just return back to, to, to their to their food and to to where they live, then it's just a coincidence. And that's probably what they'll do, isn't it? But if they just charge off back to Israel, then we'll know that God is God. And, of course, that is exactly what happens. It is clear that this is God at work. He won't be filed next to all the, the other gods. We can't just file God next to all the other things that we think Um, will save us and are glorious. We can't file God next to our career and kids' schooling and reputation and my Bible knowledge. That's not wisdom. Some years ago, back in London, um, there's a brilliant uh, takeaway, uh, a Bangladeshi takeaway that that we went to a lot. And we would phone ahead and I'd go in and and pick up the order because it was around the corner. And one evening I went round and it wasn't quite ready. So there I was just waiting for five or ten minutes and I picked up the end of this conversation. And the conversation was with one of the waiters who uh, it, it transpired was a, a Muslim gentleman and uh, a couple who were very North London and uh, progressive and all the rest of it, talking about religion. And anyway, the gist of the conversation at the end of it was that the waiter said to them, well, you know, we're all sort of the same, aren't we, really? It's all the same thing, isn't it? So some secular North London couple and a, a Muslim waiter, and they'd sort of agreed that we, it's all, you know, it's much of a muchness, isn't it, really? It's all different ways to God. And, of course, that sounds like very good wisdom, doesn't it, in North London, and, and uh, we're very tolerant. But that's not wisdom, is it? No, God's very clear. What does God say in Proverbs? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the, the ark gets sent back, but there's a further shock, isn't there? So the, uh, the ark comes back to Israel, uh, but chapter 6, uh, verse 19, God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death, because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And the people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. Now, back in the Old Testament, God had, had said, you are not to do that. And again, it's not, not, not to do with a sort of superstition or a magic but God wanted to illustrate to his people that he is holy. And this is the way that he did it. He said, with this ark, 
I will put the presence of my power, etc. And this is how you are to treat it. But the Israelites, it seems, or some of them, got a bit complacent. Great, yeah, the arts come back, it's good. Well, let's, let's open it up and check everything's okay and um, you know, check that God's still with us. Even God's people still not taking God's holiness seriously. Because, yes, the Bible says that we can be intimate with God and we can know God, confident even before God, but overly casual with God, not so much. And perhaps we or, or wider church culture can often be a little bit over familiar with God, a bit pally with God. Or the songs that we sing or, or, or others sing can be a bit floaty and a bit, you know, yeah, Jesus is, 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 is sort of um, a bit softer than, than he really is. Of course we can be confident. Of course Jesus is our brother and our friend. But God is a holy God as well. And at the heart of both of these stories is really a disregard for God's holiness. So there's a couple of options, isn't there? We can try and have God. We don't want to get rid of God. We love God. Um, but we could, well, let's try and tame the holiness bit. Let's, let's just kind of mute that down a little bit. Or the other option for the Philistines is to say, oh, no, no, God is very holy. We can see that. We don't want any of that. Thank you very much. And reject him. And so that's why that question in 6 verse 20 is a very good one. That's why the writer highlights it to us at the end of the story. The people of Beth Shemesh ask, well, who can stand in the presence of this holy God? That's a good question, isn't it? Because God's promised to be with his people and that it's a good thing that he is. Uh, but now, even though the ark is back, we can see that it ends in lament. That God's people lamented. But the answer is not to tame God because we'll lose God. We can't have God's glory without his holiness. But neither do we want to reject God because we don't need him because we do. And so who can stand before this holy God? Well, in 1 Samuel, it's already been hinted at, hasn't it? In chapter 3, verse 1. Have a flick back. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord. So there's a hint there of how God's people can be with a holy God. And we'll see more of that next week. This is really part one of the story. And we'll pick up part two next week. So there's that hint of Samuel. We've heard before, chapter 2, verse 26. Do you remember? The boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favour with the Lord and with people. Now, I wonder if that rings any bells for some of you. Perhaps familiar with the Gospel of Luke. Do you remember hearing about Jesus as a child? The very same words. The very same words. He continued to grow in stature and in favour with the Lord and his people. And so Jesus is the answer, isn't it? Emmanuel, God with us. Because we can't have God's glory, his presence, without his holiness. That's the lesson that God's people need to learn. And we need to have that reality of God. Because our, left to ourselves, humanity, well, we're, we're sort of a petulant, proud and presumptuous race, aren't we? And a God that rules in power seems egotistical. And uh, a fearsome God seems like a tyrant. A holy God seems a bit too pious. And an exclusive God seems arrogant. And so it's all too easy to say no to God. And we think that we're better off without him, like Psalm 2, freeing the shackles of this God that we can have our own sort of liberty. 
But that's really not the way to human flourishing at all, is it? As we, as we can see just looking around us. But a holy God is beautiful and pure and just, and he'll make his people holy. God's glory is for our good. Uh, and if we don't see God this way, then we'll never long for him to make us holy as he is holy. What we'll really long for is for God to make us nice as our friends are nice. But God longs to make us holy, a holy people to him. If we don't have this God, we'll never be convicted of our sin and need to change and our need for a Messiah, for an anointed one, and we'll never honour him as holy. As we finish, perhaps this morning, there may be some of us sort of on a spectrum. That we, we may be, perhaps we're down the end of treating God too casually. And we need to be reminded of the holy God. But perhaps we might be right at the other end and very well aware of God's holiness and fearful of him. Who can stand? Well, let's just close with these words from Paul in Ephesians. Jesus can stand before the holy God and united to him, we can. So Paul says this, as, you were, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions in which you used to live, and when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of, those, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. He goes on to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. And it is by grace you have been saved. And listen to this in verse 6. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Just as God promised, we can be with a holy God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself uh, throughout history. Thank you for these words in the Old Testament. Please help us to continue to get better at listening to you um, through these uh, what can seem strange and distant stories. Help us to trust that you are speaking then as you, as you speak now and that we might uh, know you more fully and more deeply. We praise you for this book uh, that confronts your people with the leadership they need, the anointed one that they need. And we praise you so much that we, uh, we read this on the other side of the fulfillment of your promises. That we know the Lord Jesus, the anointed one, who stands before you and whom in him we can be seated and that we can belong to you, a holy God, that we might be a holy people. Please help us to long for that. Please help us to see it as a, a good thing. Please help us in our um, anxieties and our worries not to go our own way. Not to put you in a box or domesticate you. But to treat you as holy. But not as a holy and distant God. We pray that we would love you and know you as our Holy God. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Let's stand and sing to an almighty God with our final song.
Please be seated. Well, do, do join us for tea and coffee after the service. Let's spur one another on as the week begins. But let's finish with the words of the grace now. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.